Here are some major pyramids in their relative proportions. Those from Djoser to Khufu were constructed over a single century about 4,600 years ago. This is the development phase of pyramid building, reaching its apex in the Great Pyramid of Giza. Whatever methods the Egyptians used were therefore well developed prior to the building of the Great Pyramid. For a sense of proportion, the Hoover Dam is much taller than the pyramids, but has about the same volume as the Khufu Pyramid. With the completion of the Great Pyramid, those of Khafre and Menkari completed the main phase of pyramid building. After these, no more large stone pyramids were built. The construction materials available to the Egyptians of the Old Kingdom were limited to copper, some iron not likely made by them, plenty of stone, wood from abroad, rope in profusion, and woven cloth and animal skins. We might also include enormous quantities of mud, clay, and plants, and whatever animal products might be useful besides leather. The primary difference between them and us is plastic and electricity. They were entirely organic, whereas we are highly artificial in our industry. In the area of machines, I contend that they could make and use wheels, may have used copper bearings, which is certainly debatable. They are known to have used straight and tubular drills for stonework. I contend that they must have had some kind of rock tongs to pick up fairly large stones with various sorts of crane devices. They certainly had some sort of lathe with which to make the stone bowls and pottery. The evidence of this is overwhelming. When a pyramid is half its height, it is nearly 90% complete by volume and the Great Pyramid was nearly half done or is only a hundred feet tall. Also, when half its height, the area available to work on at the top is one-fourth of the area of the first layer of stones. But even though there is room for only one-fourth of workers on top, they only have to place one-fourth the number of stones to complete that level. Therefore, we might expect, on this account only, that the courses could be laid down at about the same rate all the way up, albeit with less and less workers needed. The larger the blocks used, the less work, because it is easier to cut one block than eight that are half the diameter, since those eight have twice the surface area that needs to be cleaved, and the cumulative slop that develops when stacking them is half as problematic with the larger stones. Consequently, the biggest stones that can be comfortably handled are the ones to be used. The strength of materials goes up with the square of the size, while the volume goes up with the cube. Therefore, a wooden beam twice as long, but of the same form as another is four times as strong and eight times as heavy. Thus, when you scale things up bigger and bigger, they eventually break because their strength can't keep up with their weight and in pyramids and obelisks, we're dealing with really huge blocks of stone. When working with wood, we make triangles everywhere because the ends are geometrically fixed. When you make squares, they tend to collapse into parallelograms. Standard procedure then be to drill holes, insert pegs, then wrap with rope. To make a long beam, we put four boards around them, peg it, and wrap with rope. The resulting beam can be made as strong as, or stronger than a continuous beam. Rope strung between two fixed points, perpendicular to the gravitational gradient, cannot be pulled straight except by infinite force. Hence, high-tension wires have a certain slack in them that minimizes cost. In ancient Egypt, they would transmit power only by ropes mechanically, as by pulling. A long, heavy rope under tension, with only terminal restraints, has characteristic wave pattern problems that have to be dealt with. Raising two and a half tons to 240 feet is equivalent to a man climbing up an 8,800 foot stairwell, but this is well below the Guinness Book world record 
of 33,000 feet in 12 hours. For a 10-hour day, the work rate would be about one-third of the world record rate if each man were to output enough energy to raise one such block half the height of the pyramid. Here's a lathe schematic using a spool and rope drive. They must have had a lathe to work the stone bowls, of which 40,000 were found, mostly broken, in Djoser's Pyramid, which was built long before the Great Pyramid. Clearly, these couldn't be made by chipping them with a copper tool. They are too round, and if you chip too many times on thin rock, the micro-cracks created with every hit eventually join the rock breaks into pieces. They have to be turned on a lathe and cut smoothly, tangentially. Modern Egyptians use a straight saw without teeth, made from copper, to show tourists how rock was cut in ancient times. It works okay, but not as well as modern equipment. The sawdust would be part granite and part copper, so it would be taken up and re-smelted to make new saws out of the same copper. They might also have been able to make an articulated circular saw with a rope drive. Round holes were drilled with a copper pipe. However, they can't show this to the tourists because it doesn't work with just a pipe and sand. To drill a hole requires that some room be available for the detritus to get out of the hole. If not, the energy that would have gone for cutting will instead go simply to heat the rock and copper. It will just start to smoke. To actually cut the hole requires that a rock cutter wider than the pipe wall be driven by the copper pipe. This would do the actual cutting, and the detritus would find its way up and out of the hole on the sides of the copper pipe. You need at least two cutting pieces, or the pipe will be unstable in the hole. There is also evidence of possible diamond cutting tools, because some holes drilled in granite have spiral tool marks with feed rates of as much as an eighth inch per rotation. To make these would require great pressure with slow rotation, as in a drill press, wherein quick drilling is accomplished by great force with slow speed, rather than what we now accomplish with light force in a high-speed electric drill. Here's a drill press schematic utilizing a lever and pressure bearings. It's powered by a rope drive to oxen. We'd be looking at a factory setting here in some mass production. To run lots of ancient power tools, oxen are harnessed to a large spool to turn the rope drive at a slow rate with great force. The rope can then be attached to smaller spools, which would rotate at faster rates in the same way as gears. I estimate that the fastest rotation rates reasonably achievable by a rope drive system is probably no greater than 600 RPMs. That's spinning 10 times per second, and that would be a useful velocity for an ancient lathe. To run effective power transmission through ropes, we need to prevent slippage. This is accomplished by wrapping the rope around the spool at least 540 degrees. I show here 900 degrees, or two and a half turns. One requirement for accomplishing the needed positive displacement is that the spool cylinder be slightly slanted, shown exaggerated here. This allows the rope to slide over the cylinder surface to get out of the way of the new rope, just entering the spool from the output spool. If the slant is too great, it will bunch up on the other end. The exact angle depends on the slip of the cylinder and the rope together. The choice here is entirely empirical. It is also possible to change the direction of the power output by 90 degrees simply by turning the receiver spool by 90 degrees before applying the rope. We can take two spools with parallel axes of rotation and turn one to 90 degrees after the ropes are on, but the two rope lines to and from will necessarily touch, causing unnecessary wear on the ropes by friction. There is a good deal more to rope drives than meets the eye. It's an entire technology with which we are no longer familiar in the 21st century. It is not generally conceded that ancient peoples could make and utilize bearings. However, there was nothing preventing them from doing so. If you can smelt copper and cut granite, 
you can make bearings. Here's a granite core from a drill hole. We mount it in a mold and pour liquid copper down the hole. When it cools, we break the mold and get a large copper bearing. We could also use granite chips mixed with copper and coat that with a smooth, pure copper cladding. The same is true for ball bearings. The use of granite is to bulk out the bearing with cheap rock that takes well to pressure and save the copper, which is much more expensive. We need to make a race for the bearings that keeps them in line and spaced properly. We just make a mold, pour the copper and wait till it cools. Then we make some copper rivets to put into wood spacers and the race is made. This is all well within the capabilities of anyone who could pour liquid copper into a mold. Whether they actually did so is another matter. Here's a finished roller for rope hauling on the pyramid project. If they didn't use bearings, they would have used copper sleeves with whatever animal or plant material they had that would pass for grease. Copper has excellent heat dissipation properties, so copper sleeves would also work, just not as well as bearings. When used with a larger wheel, the total heat energy deposited in the copper sleeve can be greatly lessened because though the pressure remains the same on the sleeve, it makes fewer turns to get a given pulling job done. Pictures of the quarry beds around Giza show slabs of source rock with narrow channels dug between them. The channels look to be about two feet wide. They cut the slabs apart in the standard manner with the plug and feather method shown in many other videos. Then use levers to dump them onto wooden sledges. Running these sledges over dry ground is too hard and would not have been done for over two million blocks. Sliding them on mud contained within a wooden mud track would be preferable. Here, two tracks are lined with pitch to help retain the water, while giving the pullers a dry place to walk. The tracks would have to be a little wider to accommodate turning. I put an animal skin water bag with a steady dripper to save on hauling water. Evaporation in the Egyptian heat must have been a big problem with mud hauling systems. They had plenty of experience with mud and probably had different kinds that were slick as snot on a doorknob. Whatever specialized mud knowledge they had is now lost. With all that hauling, the track system might look like an exposed Grand Central Station. For my part, I think in terms of wheels, which Egyptologists say they did not use because they didn't know what a wheel was. Perhaps not but here are some wheel carts anyway. They certainly could have made them with the tools then available. A two-wheel cart of this type is practical for man-powered short hauls of stones in the one to three metric ton range. The wheels are quite large and wide so as to roll on sand or any fairly irregular surface pulled by a dozen men or so. The spokes can be made to any degree of strength so there is no breakage problem. If we incorporate bearings too, or grease sliding copper sleeves, we're off to the pyramid several times per day per cart. Here's a design I call crane style, because it can be used as a small crane, and we can grab a rock some distance away from the wheelbase and pull it in close to the axle for greater leverage. A movable extension gives temporary leverage or could accommodate more pullers. The weight of the rock can be directly under the axle if we split the axle in two pieces so that the tongue takes no force to hold down during transit. The mast can be used to lower a block into a hole by means of a rope. One man can then lower it by utilizing the friction of the rope on wood around the upper beam. It is necessary to lower some blocks into holes by the geometry of the construction if the pyramid's casing blocks are laid first. To grab the rocks to be hauled in an efficient manner, I designed some rock tongs made with copper wheels with offset axles. The object is to quickly engage the object piece without unnecessary travel. 
Since the cams are already touching the piece when applied, lifting produces the most rapid tightening I could think of. You put the gizmo on the rock and it's up in the air in perhaps two inches. Putting the piece in the hole, the cams touch the side which forces them to open, thus releasing the rock to drop the remaining distance. The cam arms would slide in the harness to accommodate different sizes of rocks and would be secured by a rope and boat cleat system, which is quick and has little or no give to it. The stones of the first couple of layers of the pyramid are quite a bit larger than the others. Here's a tractor to haul them and the method of its use. A wooden truss bears the weight. We hook up the stone with ropes then run it up on four wood ramps with a small dip in the high point so that it will settle there easily. Next we put sand under the load, detach the ropes, move the tractor back off the ramps, take the ramps away, move the tractor back over the load and reattach the ropes. Lastly we take out the sand under the load and it is suspended a few inches above ground level. Good to go. Here's a rear view and a top view. Note that we need a sliding or ball bearing to take the weight on the front steering assembly. The big tractor won't fit into the quarry rows, so something narrower is needed to take out one or two ton stones. This will be a two-wheeled piece, the wheels of which will be about two feet in height and the width of the combined wheels about two feet also. The bearing shown could be replaced by sliding sleeves as well. The spokes are extremely robust and will easily take this weight. The wheel itself has a two-ply tread, all fitted together with wooden dowels that allow total disassembly if required, as when the outer tread pieces become worn by use. In this front view there are two grooves cut into the outer tread to accommodate the rope that binds it all together. There are holes to pass the rope through to the inside of the wheel for fastening. A stick is inserted into the now tied rope and twisted to take up the slack and tighten the construction. Then it's inserted between the spokes to secure it from unwinding. We mount it to the axle and apply two wheel covers to keep out the dirt and two copper washers for them to slide against preventing wear on the wood. The wheel is secured to the axle with a dowel pounded in with a mallet. Here's the finished assembly to which we fit the tongue which has a copper male end that fits into the female end of the cam tongue assembly made for this apparatus. It's picked up at both ends. In this way we get the leverage to raise a stone and don't have to put the load between the wheels, which is impossible within the confines of the quarry lanes. And we can get a pretty good turning radius as well. All ramp ideas propose a single feeder method. That is, stones follow one after another as in a conga line. For the Great Pyramid, this means that one stone had to be placed roughly every four and a half minutes, continuously, day and night, year round, to complete the pyramid in 20 years. If, on the other hand, one uses a multiple feeder method, as in going up the sides of the pyramid, it is possible that, for the first half of the pyramid's height, as many as 100 feeder lines could be used. One obvious flaw in Jean-Pierre Houdin's theory of an interior ramp is that no one is seen coming down. You only see men dragging stones up. How do they get down with their empty sledge? Do they squeeze by in the narrow corridor passing those on the way up? They might have to pass 100 other sledges who are still on their way up, each with, say, 25 guys hauling. Do they then say, Excuse me, please, may I pass? A thousand times on the way down? If everything goes up in a conga line, what happens when there's an accident or a problem? The conga line stops just like an assembly line making cars. Are there two-lane ramps or double screw threads, one up and one down? 
And they work at night? Really? With multiple feeder lines, thousands of stones per day could get to the top, and the pyramid could be built in months instead of decades, if getting them up there were the only problem. All things considered, less than ten years is most probable. Certainly not twenty years working day and night in a conga line, placing only 315 stones per day. That's ridiculous. The first couple of courses are very heavy stones in the nine-ton range. A standard ramp would be used here. But after ten feet up or so, they'd be installing another method which is simpler than building a huge ramp. We put two roller-bearing units on top, and cut out a space in the earthen ramp, shore this up, and install a slanted dumbwaiter. Two hauling ropes are connected to either side of the dumbwaiter, which go over the bearing units and back down to buried bearing units, then out to the haulers by way of underground rope passages. This keeps the ropes out of the way of the workers, delivering stones to the dumbwaiter. At the level depicted, they could deliver more stones than the people on top could possibly set, as many as 20,000. Therefore, it is important to keep the haulers off the top, so that they are not interfering with the setters. No men would be stationed on the sides. They would be all on the top or at the base of the pyramid, with the exception of maintenance workers. This is the fastest way to deliver rocks to the top of a pyramid. There could be tracks going up any side of the pyramid in the manner of slanted scaffolding, but I forgot to draw the scaffolding in this picture. Here's one of the tractors for the big blocks, which we're finished with at this point. The hauling ropes emerge from the underground passage far enough away from the loading action so as not to interfere. They slide along in a V-shaped trowel where it is connected to hauling poles. This is necessary because a long rope will develop waves in it and can flip the load off the dumbwaiter if the mass of the rope is comparable to the load mass. A rope through which a pulling force is transmitted cannot in general be left hanging over long distances. And there are two ropes per dumbwaiter, so a line of haulers, 40 by 5 wide, would cover about two-thirds of a football field. Two hundred men to haul a two-and-a-half-ton block up is reasonable. However, at the 240-foot level, half the height of the pyramid, 150 blocks per day would require that the men walk about 17 miles. That's too far. At that level, I'd cut the workload in half to 75 blocks per day per dumbwaiter. So if there are only 40 feed lines at 75 blocks per day, you'd still get 3,000 blocks per day to the top. Here we come to a most important problem, shade. It's very hot. The entire route should be shaded with some cheap woven reed mat thing, which shades the men, but doesn't inhibit airflow. In keeping with that, they need to be watered constantly, and perhaps fed. Here's the restroom but they won't use it much because they'll be pretty dried out after a day's work, and they'll all be constipated too. What they do need is a shower. That is, I would refuse to do this kind of work if I could not shower afterwards. And they need to be at their best when they visit. Here it comes. Wait for it the ubiquitous entertainment tent. Up top there are two basic stones, the facing tour limestones and the crudely made interior limestone blocks. The first problem here is we need to level each course so that we can work on it. The area in the quarry from which the interior stones are to be cut must be selected first because these will all be of, of about the same thickness, given the way these blocks break away from the bed they are in. When this is done, 
an order is sent to the Tura stone quarry across the Nile to trim the facing stones to the interior stone specks so that the next pyramid course will come out level and we won't get the gapping problem shown. Egyptologists state that there is a difficulty with checking the progress of the pyramid's construction if a ramp were to cover the sides. This assumption is false. It is not necessary to site the pyramid at all from the sides, provided that it starts out with reasonable accuracy. We can access all the measurements we need at the top of the pyramid only. These measurements will ensure that the structure is properly built all the way up. What we need to do is complete a given course and halt production for a time to take measurements. We need twine long enough to check the lengths of the sides for equality, then check the diagonal for square. That is, measure one diagonal AB, then see if the other diagonal CD is the same using that same piece of twine. And this can be done several times in the readings average to see if it was within tolerances. Now we do roughly the same thing for the midpoint sides where the slightly angled stone is placed to make the eight-sided pyramid and we check EF for equality with GH. We also need to check the short lengths for equality in case the EFGH square has rotated inside the ABCD square, and to see if ABCD has rotated from the previous courses, we align two marks with a pole star, or other marks with known landmarks. To check that all relevant points are level and coplanar, we need a surveying instrument consisting of a water-filled x trowel with leveling marks inscribed in the trowel attached to wire sights as shown. To do this, the instrument must be at the correct height relative to standard markers placed at the points to be checked. We need measurements for ABCD and EFGH done at the same trowel height. If all is well, production proceeds. If the structure is out of spec, corrective measures must be devised and taken in the next course. Because the Torah facing stones are cut to templates that have no inherent left-right or up-down bias, they will undoubtedly be within spec throughout the pyramid construction. Hence, it is quite probable that if the facing stones are carefully assembled, the pyramid will come out right without ever measuring anything at all on site after the first course has been set, being that there are only 210 courses in all. If you are off by one quarter of an inch per course, you'd be off by about four feet at the top. That would be noticeable. But, again, there is no cumulative bias when using templates or in the assembly venue so any error is likely to be offset by a corresponding error in the other direction. There are five basic facing stone types. The corner stones, the center indent stones that force out the eight-sided pyramid, all the straight stones of varying widths, and a three-stone set consisting of a right and left-handed angled stone into which fits the final keystone. Because the corner stones and center indents must be aligned first, there are eight keystone sets per level. The function of the keystone is to cover the cumulative slop inherent in positioning all the straight facing stones. It is impossible that the last stone in each of the eight sides will fit properly, and you can't slide a stone into place between two parallel planes. It won't work. The solution is to select straight stones of such widths that at the end the left and right handed stones make a hole just about right for the keystone to be inserted. When inserted it will protrude over the edge slightly. The stone is then marked with a line. The keystone is withdrawn and dressed to proper size then reinserted to fit perfectly. There is no way around this process. Note that the keystone is wider and longer at the rear to facilitate pulling it out with some type of tongs. 
Pushing the Torah facing stones into place is a delicate matter. The entire visible face of the stone must not be chipped, or it becomes useless, or it have to be plaster corrected, which is bad construction practice. Consequently, a device must be used that is both strong enough to push a very heavy stone, yet exact enough to slowly push it into place with great precision. It must conform to a straight edge placed upon it, and the previous stone below, with as near to zero tolerance as is humanly possible. This tool I call an incher. It is fixed to the previous layer by a spike shoved into the, an available crack, and set up with the other end touching or nearly touching the block to be moved. Spacer blocks of assorted size are put into a gap in the device. Then the levers are used to advance the block, and new spaces are put in to reset the two fulcrum pieces. By the action of the lever, you can see that it can be used either in a push or pull configuration, depending on available space or the preference of the workers. The lever can be made long enough to accommodate as many workers as necessary. The lever ratio is very high so that the stone moves only slightly for each push before resetting with other spacers, and should be accurate to any spec they would have made. If an idiot were to overshoot the edge, there would be a problem because the front edge is delicate and the stone must be withdrawn. One way to do this is to force the idiot to drill a hole and insert a pulling device such as the one shown and reverse the incher to pull it out enough to be flushed with a lower stone. This would be a rare occurrence, since an incher-type tool would be very exact. These stones are very heavy and cannot be moved by two guys with six-foot-long sticks. It requires a lever of high ratio and slow movement, all checked with a straight edge. The interior stones are another story. To get them into final position, I've settled on what I call a crude mover. You slap it on top of the stone, tighten it and tie it off with a rope to boat cleats or something similar. This is a fast fit. Then several men push the lever back and forth while at the same time pushing it forward. You can see why it will move forward when you add up the vectors. The tactic is used in many places when just pushing doesn't work. Men will spontaneously move an object back and forth while pushing or pulling it. They may not even know why it works, but it does, and quite easily, and is a common practice. There are several dozen very large blocks used in the construction of the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid that I thought could be raised one level at a time by the rock and shock method, rocking the large stone block on the long axis and taking them up one level at a time. This is quite feasible, but they may have taken them up all at once as well. At the base of the pyramid, these very large stones would lend themselves to rolling when fitted with wheels, but not in soft sand. Taking 60 tons up the side presents an interesting problem in engineering worth solving, at least in principle. Seen from the end, the blocks are put on two or three of the dumb waiters, though they can't be pulled up with them. At best, they are an assist. The main force for raising them comes from ten ropes that go over a mast at the top level required. The pivoting mass must split the overall rope angle such that angle A equals angle B. Since the force pulling is by definition equal to the force resisting, the mast will remain stationary and needs no support when in tension. When it gets to the top, it will slide off the dumbwaiter onto the top stones while the mast gradually keels over and falls but only after the large stone is securely on top. Then it can continue to be pulled along or disposed of in some other manner. Here is a view of the top mast with ten six-ton ropes over roller or sleeve bearings. 
These ropes go over the pyramid and down the other side, where the force is applied. They are attached to a counterweight under the sand that must take the weight of the entire stone, so I have given it as 100 tons of counterweight. Each rope goes under a roller or sleeve bearing and into a trowel where it encounters several cam wheels that allow only one-way motion. Thus, if we stop pulling on the rope, the stone cannot fall down the other face of the pyramid. It will stick in place in its present position. Now the rope goes to another ground-level mast with a 10 to 1 lever arm. It goes through another one-way cam trowel so that when the lever arm is pulled, the stone rises by another increment. On this mast, I have placed a counterweight to reset the mast after it has been pulled. Otherwise, some men would have to reset it each time it was pulled. Another guy collects the slack rope, pulling it through the mast cam after reset. Here's a drawing of the initial bearings with a line of cam stops to keep the stone from falling on the other side of the pyramid. Here's what the mast might look like, and here's the combined machine. It's elaborate, but this is what it would take minimally to get a large stone up in less than one day. Here's a bird's eye view of the 600 men, 60 per rope, each pulling a 10 to 1 lever, making them equivalent to 6,000 men. We're here using leverage because it is difficult to deal with 6,000 men at once, and there may be no room to stand them anyway. The pyramid itself would actually be much larger than I've drawn it. My estimate is that they could raise eight blocks per day using this method, and that's about what they need for a given level. Once on top, a method of moving them around would be the previously described mud track tactic. The large block sits on two wide mud skids. Ropes are secured to the block itself, not to the mud skid. Depending on the slipperiness of the medium, perhaps 100 men could pull the block on a horizontal track. A method of turning and parking blocks is shown. The block is moved toward its final destination and pushed off the skids onto the two blocks that supported that level by means of large wooden levers. Where the skid meets the resting blocks, it is just a bit higher than those blocks so that the object block can be slid off. The wedges are knocked out and the pins removed that allow the skids to be pushed along with the block on the mud track. This is the easiest method I can think of for moving those 60-ton blocks over a flat surface and getting them to their final position. Setting the last stones near the top of the pyramid presents a problem of insufficient space to work in and seems to be best solved with a crane that has been hoisted up in the fashion of other stones. When the desired position is reached, the crane must be secured to the track. It must have a counterweight to prevent it from tipping over when used. A stone is brought up and hooked to the crane, then pulled from the opposite side of the pyramid and positioned by such men as it can easily fit in the restricted work area. At some point, the roller assembly on the top must be removed and the final stones hauled up by the crane. This requires that the dumbwaiter be fixed temporarily to the track to use the crane on the stone itself, or this might be done with a separate second rope. This continues to the top where the pyramidion is finally set up to finish the job. But before it can be placed, we need to have a hootenanny with the assembled dignitaries. Perhaps the pharaoh himself would be hauled up. Afterwards, the last stone is dropped and the disassembly of the tracks begins. We need a roller assembly once again, but fixed this time to the track on the side of the pyramid. The crane goes down as it was brought up. An empty dumbwaiter is brought up and workers clamor over the tracks, disassembling them and stacking the wood on the dumbwaiter. When the tops of the tracks are gone, the roller assembly must be manually lowered 
and the process repeated all the way down 480 feet to ground level. This could take a couple of weeks. Finally, it's over. Hoorah! Here's the whole thing again in stop action. In the grand gallery, there are rows of holes on the benches on either side of the gallery. Their purpose, I believe, was to support a wooden walkway, a stairwell on top of blocks, which were to slide down to block the ascending passage. However, that walkway was never built, and the holes in the sides were blocked up with a crudely made limestone block, glued in with plaster. Across this alteration, an area is crudely chipped out which may have been designed to accommodate a piece of wood, again unused for whatever its intended purpose. There is another crudely chiseled formation about 14 feet up the wall, running the entire length of the gallery on either side. It's about 6 inches wide and 1 inch deep. I believe this was meant to accommodate another piece of lumber, that would be used to support a ceiling over the walkway. Thus the funeral procession would have pulled the mummy up the gallery to the king's chamber. But none of this was ever actually made, for reasons we can only guess at. One important feature of the interior that is not too much discussed is the absence of light and air for those working inside. The supposed air shafts may have been just that, relying on a difference in air pressure from one side of the pyramid to the other. This would ensure at least some air flow. They would be sealed but not needed so that tomb robbers could not insert a straight probe in sections down the hole. By doing this they could locate the main chamber and thus know about where to aim their excavations. Miners can dig a tunnel into solid rock without too much difficulty and have been able to do so for millennia. But if you don't know exactly where the treasure is, you might turn the pyramid into Swiss cheese trying to hit the mother load. Think how tiny the king's chamber is in comparison to the volume of the pyramid, and understand the difficulty in constructing a crawl tunnel through loose stonework. What they need is air and light, and they can't get that in a long, thin tunnel. For light, you need torches or at least a candle. In a very short tunnel, you might reflect light from a polished metal mirror, but that's no good for anything of great length. And torches eat prodigious amounts of air. To get the air to work on the inside of a pyramid, you need a wooden ductwork with working bellows to blow in the required quantity of oxygen. Here's a duct system that can accommodate torchlight and deliver air to breathe. Some of the blown-in air is bled off before getting to the torch for people to breathe. A low pressure is maintained in the outflow channel to suck out the carbon dioxide and smoke from the torch. Ideally, both intake and outflow are pressured by bellows operated on the outside. This is a continuous operation, just like the old church organs, where some kid had to pump air in the back of the organ, or there was no music forthcoming. If the bellow stops, any men working with a torch inside must get out immediately or suffocate. This is not a small problem. Here in the Grand Gallery, what I believe they intended was to cover the stones poised to run down into the ascending passage with a stairwell over which the funeral procession would walk, carrying Khufu's remains to place in the sarcophagus. On the sides and above would be installed a wooden, richly decorated tunnel, prepared in a workshop outside of the pyramid, then brought in and simply installed in the form of panels. This would resolve the problem of not enough light for the artists to see what they're doing. On each wall of the gallery, about halfway up, about 14 feet, 
there is a crudely made groove, six inches wide by one inch deep, that runs the entire length of the gallery. Others have supposed it to be for a roof, and I agree with this. Wood planks were to be inserted in this groove with cross beams locking them in place. Into these beams and in the side supports would be slots to lock in large panels of whatever artworks were to be used to decorate the tunnel. We're missing something. Hmm, what is it? Oh, yeah. But none of this was ever actually made. It appears that they abandoned the idea of a walkway over the stones, then abandoned the idea of a tunnel as well, as though somebody said, Forget the walkway, nobody's coming through this way. And later, And forget about the tunnel, it's not needed either. There must be two stages to the work stoppage because of the groove chisel out of the limestone plugs. First they cancel the walkway and plug the hole. Then they cut a groove across the plug to accommodate a vertical beam for the panels. Then they cancel that, too. The stones, which were to slide down the incline into the ascending passages, may have been designed like this, though there is no evidence even these were used. If only the three granite plugs were used, and the other plug stones were not used, what did they do with those other stones? Were they pulled out from above? Cancelled before the corbeling was finished? Anyway, this is what I think they had in mind. This is a compound lever system that's a relative of the clock escapement. The design is to run down after everyone is safely out of the pyramid. It's to be set off by a trip mechanism when a long rope is pulled. This is a six-to-one lever for about two dozen stones, one behind the other, each with its own lever of the same type. I did the math and found this was a limit problem, wherein no matter how many stones are lined up, the amount of force needed to hold them back is negligible and lends itself to a trip mechanism. Here's our line of stones. When the trip stick is pulled out with a long rope from the outside, the blocks slide down to the ascending passage. The last three blocks would be the granite ones now blocking the beginning of the ascending passage. I think this was originally intended to be a kinetic tomb defense, the like of which exists only in Indiana Jones type movies. You know, the gizmo where you step on the wrong stone and arrows shoot out of you and a big rock comes down and squashes you. What I mean is that after the trap is set, when a tomb robber comes, he has to contend not with just heavy stones and false leads, but also an active mechanism. The first stone that goes into the descending passage hits a sandbag and stops. It's made too big to go down the descending passage. When the tomb robbers chop it out, the next stone drops down, and it is a little smaller, and slides down the descending passage, blocking it at the bottom. Then another large block comes down, and the robbers have to chop it out, and the same thing happens again. This may be why the holes in the Grand Gallery are of alternating pairs of different sizes. After a dozen cycles of this, any robbers still left are faced with this dilemma. All grave goods are down under the pyramid or mastaba. They have to go down and chop out the blocks that went that way in the belief that that's where the treasure is. If they look up at the granite stones that block the ascending passage, they must think they want us to go that way and waste our time because no grave goods are ever there. To make this design, you'd have to know for certain that it would work. There is what appears to some to be a model of the ascending-descending passage juncture near the pyramid cut in bedrock that may have been used to assess the workability of something in the pyramid. In the ascending passage that would be blocked by the line of stones, there are the girdle stones. These are very large blocks that wrap around the entire ascending passage. Some are one half the way around, fitted to another half. The purpose of these is unknown, though Flinders Petrie, 
proposed that they prevented the granite stones that blocked the passageway at its end from spreading the adjacent stones, which were tapered, to stop the granite blocking stones from going into the descending passage. And this is a good guess as to their purpose. I propose a different tentative purpose, if the reason is not symbolic or purely structural. They may be interactive. They may be a form of static break to slow down the sliding blocks. For this to be so, the vertical sides of the hole in the girdle stones must taper such that the blocks are allowed to go through, but the hole is just a bit smaller than the previous part of the ascending passage. The optimum effect would be if the vertical sides were rounded as shown. This would cause blocks to twist about their center of mass as they bounce between the two rounded sides, thus slowing them down but not preventing descent. Note that this is a view from the top. The blocks would wiggle from left to right, but not up and down. The floor and the ceiling of the hole would be flat like the tunnel itself. A bump in the floor could stop the slide. We only want to slow it down. I haven't seen these stones or even good pictures of them, so perhaps this is not supported by the shape of the girdle stones themselves. Such slowing would allow the smaller stones time to go down the descending shaft and be out of the way for the next blocking stone to fall into the descending shaft. If no slowing occurred, the rocks would jam up and not alternately slide down then block the descending passage as shown. It also may have been designed to perform this function, then been not used in the finalized pyramid. Two internal structures are not engineered as I would have done. The Grand Gallery sides are slanted. I would have made them level with the gravitational potential. However, this is a slightly more complicated design. We might here consider Houdin's theory that the Grand Gallery was used as a counterweight trolley system. This makes no engineering sense. If we need a counterweight to pull up the large blocks, when one is pulled up, you have to unload all the small blocks in the trolley, then haul the empty trolley back up, then take the small counterweight stones back up to the trolley one at a time and reinstall them into the trolley so that the counterweight is ready for the next large block. You can't in principle just haul up the trolley when it's full, for if you could haul up the full trolley, by definition, you could just haul up the large block instead, straight away without the trolley because by definition of a counterweight, the trolley must be heavier than the large block it's used to pull up. So if we have the manpower to bring up a large block all at once, we don't need a trolley. It's a pointless extra step. If we don't have enough manpower to bring up a large block all at once, by the nature of the beast, we have to unload the trolley at the bottom and haul all the small rocks back up and reload the trolley again at the high point. And as I've shown previously, it appears that they could haul up the large blocks all at once with only 600 men distributed on 10 rope lines. The so-called relieving chambers perform no engineering function, and I have concluded that they are purely symbolic in nature. They are there to fulfill some religious proposition. They have absolutely no mechanical or architectural function. One could have Lincoln logged a corbel wall all the way to the top of the pyramid if it was wanted. A chimney with straight walls right up to the top is easily accomplished. Yet they chose this weird thing. Whatever. But it doesn't relieve anything. It's just there. Here's a story I've made up to account for all the odd stuff in the pyramid interior. It's not true. It's just a story to link the facts together. Something like it may have occurred, but we probably can never know. We see that Khufu's alleged son, Khafre, has a pyramid that's nearly as large as his father's. It's actually a higher because it begins at a higher level. I say alleged son because nobody then knew who was whose. There is no genetic DNA testing. Khafre may have been the son of the captain of the Queen's Guard, for instance. Or maybe he was the son of the queen's horse, for all we know. 
the sarcophagus in the king's chamber has been savaged by people with anger management problems. It is clear that Caliph al-Mamun, whose men first broke into the king's chamber, tried to pry off the lid and were unsuccessful, so they hacked a hole in the corner and used the hole to lever off the lid. The fact that they levered off the lid indicates that something desirable was inside the sarcophagus, else they wouldn't have bothered to remove the lid. Clearly, they could see by torchlight into the sarcophagus through the broken corner. They pushed the lid off and took whatever was inside. The lid must have broken into several pieces and been left on the floor. The statement of Al-Mamun that there was nothing inside is about as dependable as a butane lighter in a hurricane. He's a potentate who kills people, has numerous slaves, and is not part of the truth movement. Here's my attempt to fit the facts. Khufu is dead by the time the king's chamber is constructed. He's mummified and put into a kingly sarcophagus to be transported to the king's chamber in the unfinished pyramid. Crossing the Nile, the barge is sunk, accidentally of course, and they put a junk sarcophagus inside the king's chamber, along with perhaps 5% of the treasure that was supposed to accompany Khufu, who's at the bottom of the Nile. Khafre, who had his father killed with the help of some high priest, pockets the other 95% to help him building his own tomb, to be grander than Khufu's. He has to finish the Great Pyramid, because the natives are getting restless and smell a rat. Note here that there are no coincidences in statecraft, so Khafre must have murdered his alleged father. Statecraft is like chess, having few players on the board and few moves, whereas Warcraft has many possible players on the board and lots of coincidences. Warcraft is more like Stratego. Chess is logic. Stratego is probability. This is why the plan of the Great Pyramid has changed several times. You don't need the ornate tunnel because there is no king to be buried there. You don't need all those blocking stones because there is little treasure to defend. It's going to be a symbolic burial of Khufu's bed, comb, headdress, and bows and arrows. The tomb of some junk with a little gold thrown in. There is this notch at the top of the Grand Gallery. I contend that it was cut out with an iron chisel in a couple hours. It appears hastily cut with little regard to design. It's functional. My guess is that it was installed by those individuals who used it to lower by rope and pulley all the debris left by tomb robbers and sundry visitors. This would be some pyramid cult that had reverence for the thing and took it upon themselves to clean it up, free of charge. We can now move forward about a thousand years to the unfinished obelisk. The amount of granite excavated is on the order of 400 cubic yards. This gargantuan thing is said to have been carved out of the granite by men using rock hand tools. That is, they held a rock in their hand and hacked away as shown here. There might have been as many as 100 hackers in the trenches around the obelisk, but not more as there is no more room. The problem with this theory is that it is physiologically impossible to chop granite in this manner. We can calculate the number of strikes per day on the wall of the trench. Let's say you hit it once per second. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, pow, 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 like that. That's 60 times per minute and 3,600 times per hour. And for a 10-hour day, that's 36,000 pounds per day. Now that's what I call pounding off. Understand that the damage you do to the wall is directly proportional to the force with which you strike the wall with the rock. If you just nick it a little, you won't get very far. You need to smash the bejesus out of it to get good results. And without any padding, each strike is logically equivalent to smashing the wall directly with your fist because the little damage you do will not significantly affect the impulse to your hand. So, do you think you could hit a wall with your hand really hard 36,000 times per day, day after day after day, with impunity? Or do you think that you develop tendonitis right away, 
and maybe an assortment of stress fractures in your phalanges and metacarpals. Maybe a hairline crack in your wrist. Do you think you might sprain your wrist a bit? Still, there are these handheld rocks strewn about all over the place. Not only here, but in Peru and just about anywhere where large rocks are formed into shapes. The truth is that they are using the small handheld rocks as a chisel and hitting them with a mallet. You don't find the mallets because they're wearing out the chisels faster than their stone mallets. If these stonemasons had an iron chisel, do you think they would smash the chisel into the rocks with a throwing motion? Or would they hold the chisel against the object piece and hit it with a mallet? If you hold the chisel to the piece and hit it, you reduce the impulse to nearly zero for both hands and can continue to work without the aforementioned injuries indefinitely. Here's a tool I devised to reduce the impulse to the hand and arms. You split an egg-shaped rock in two and use the split edge as your cutting edge by attaching it to the end of a stick with a leather sling. Then you attach a wooden shield to it so you don't get rocks in your face and go to work with that. It would be like a hand axe or a pick if made larger. I don't think they used anything like this, though. There isn't enough room in a trench to sling it and your neighbor would get hit with rock fragments and start a fight. I want something more efficient, something that can make these markings. They look like they've been cut with some sort of wheel, a rotary abrasion tool. So here's my design. We have a wheel about three feet in diameter and five inches wide. Removing the cover reveals 24 wooden slots into which we fit 24 cylindrical granite plugs that we've extracted from holes drilled with a tubular drill known to have been used by the Egyptians. A slot is cut for the neck on each plug with a groove cutter, something like a pipe cutter, or maybe on a lathe. Then we notch the groove at the neck for the purpose of attaching a rope which holds the plug inside its slot. The rope in turn is attached to a loose wheel inside the gizmo such that when the loose wheel rotates within the larger wheel, the plugs extend out of the slots to contact the object to be cut, something like a weed whacker letting out more plastic string. There is a slotted hole carved in the inside loose wheel so that when we put on the cover plate, five corresponding holes with wooden pegs fit to the inside slot. Now when we remove a peg, the inside loose wheel rotates to the next peg, allowing the 24 plugs to move further out of the wheel housing but only to the next peg, which holds them at that position. In this way, we gradually let out the stone cylinder cutting edges to wear down the object rock, and they in turn are also worn away. Now we install the finished wheel on the machine frame as shown. One guy runs the crank, the other guy the controls. He could swing the wheel against the object piece, as well as lower it as the object rock is worn away. Periodically, they must stop to take out a peg and release more cutting edge. They move it to a new location with levers. The squares in the stone appear to be done for successive moves, which are to the next point of maximum removal. That is, they wouldn't bother to move the entire gizmo one inch. They'd move it to optimize the amount of rock they could cut without having to move it again. To me, these squares look like machine artifacts. There is another way to cut rock by drilling and feathering a crack from one hole to the other. The hole is made successively larger and the rock is removed in chunks. So we might ask if this technique is easier than what they actually did. Apparently not, but we'd see this instead of this. The trench is also undercut ostensibly by the same mechanism in the manner shown. The operator is down in the trench and another guy cranks the rope in a manner similar to before and can lower the gizmo by advancing the cranking mechanism. The operator can swing the cutting wheel side to side and back and forth to some extent to maximize the amount of cutting between successive lowerings of the machine. Such wheel machines can deliver about 24 strikes per second instead of just one as with a handheld chisel. It would sound like a jackhammer, but with less volume. 
On the principle of equal damage, the wear on the object piece would be that of the wear on the cylindrical cutting stones. If both stones are of the same type, we could perhaps cut loose one cubic foot of granite before a refurbished wheel would have to be installed. The ancient Egyptians used rocket science to propel the obelisk to its destination. Here's the geometry. If there is an arc beneath the square cross-section of the obelisk, such that xy is less than xz, the obelisk will easily tip over. If xy equals xz, it's in danger of being tipped over, but might not. But if xy is more than xz, there is no danger of tipping over because to do so you'd have to raise the center of mass of the gargantuan obelisk, and this can't be done, at least not by accident. However, it will rock back and forth easily for the first few degrees of displacement. Easy to rock, but not to tip over. What we're going to do is undercut the obelisk with many holes that go all the way through and leave some stone to hold it in place while we install heavy-duty wooden rockers all along the length of the obelisk. When enough are installed, the remaining rock is cut away and the obelisk cracked off and is now loose on the rockers. Now, as we rock the obelisk side to side, we throw sand in under it. The rockers ride up on the sand and gradually the obelisk rises to the surface. I've shown it exaggerated. In practice, I calculate that about 300 men could raise it to the surface in about four hours by rocking it through 1,000 cycles, raising up about four millimeters per cycle. That's under ideal conditions and everything working perfectly. In practice, I give it two or three days to get it up with plenty of cursing. As to the mechanics of rocking, I first thought of just having a platform on top and everyone would just walk from one side to the other while some others toss sand under the bus. Then I thought a long, heavy pendulum on top could be swung back and forth. I finally gave those up for a simple mast and rope pull from the sides. One hundred guys on each side, with another one hundred throwing sand under. Here's one of the guys on the side, sticking his foot in a loop he's tied in his rope. Into the rope is inserted a wood footrest. The footrest would be initially about 18 inches high, and he's put his foot in the loop and raised himself up on the rope, in unison with the other 99 guys, and their weight would tip the obelisk in their direction. They alternate with the guys on the other side who take their weight off the ropes as their rope goes back up. Once the obelisk is up, the remaining rock is cut away from the bottom and rockers are fitted to the entire length of the obelisk, and rounded pieces are fitted to the front and rear of the obelisk, so that we have what amounts to a boat hull. Understand that the obelisk can be rotated also by rocking it, and selectively removing or adding sand, as shown. Note here that to contain the sand beneath the obelisk, we need portable walls, and that the higher the obelisk is raised, the wider the walls must be, or that tremendous weight will spread the sand instead of running forward on it. So we want to keep the obelisk as close to the ground as possible, to avoid having to move so much sand and wood. As we rock the obelisk from side to side, because it is on a slight angle, it will move forward. We simply put sand under it as we did to raise it, and more in the front. It's basically surfing on a sand wave, albeit very slowly. My guess is that these men can move the obelisk forward, perhaps 50 meters per day. So a kilometer in three weeks is not undoable. And they wouldn't have far to go anyway, because most of the travel is by barge on the Nile. This is done by transporting the obelisk to a prepared dry dock and inserting twin barges beneath it. When the Nile flood comes, the barges raise up the obelisk, and they take it down the Nile to another prepared dock, where the process is reversed when the Nile flooding recedes. It can then be transported to the erection site. From the look of one obelisk base I saw, it looks like the Egyptian engineers wanted to mate the obelisk to the base at about a 30 degree angle. 
If the base was sunk to some extent into the surrounding rock, it may have been slightly movable to assist in mating it properly with a much larger stone. Upon arriving at the site, the obelisk is raised, then the bottom is lowered into the base. This is accomplished with slots in the side of the sand containment wall, which are open, and the sand comes out or is pulled out with a hoe or similar tool. Now the difficult part. We have to construct on the opposite side a similar mound of sand with a platform on which we pile a quantity of small stones to act as a counterweight to the obelisk. When enough are added, the two sides are attached by many ropes and the sand is let out of the opposing hill. This raises the obelisk to perhaps 60 degrees. The mound behind the obelisk is raised again so they can rest on that mound while the opposite counterweight is reset at a lesser angle now and with less weight because it now has leverage on the obelisk. Before the reset counterweight is lowered, we must install a drag block to the obelisk because when its center of mass moves past the point of contact with the base, the obelisk will fall the rest of the way into its final position. The drag block dampens this fall so that the corners of the obelisk don't get damaged by too great an impulse when it finally hits the base with force. Now we remove everything and install scaffolding for the artisans to carve the artwork on the obelisk. Then this is removed and the final product is ready for the dedication ceremony, wherein the bigwigs congratulate one another on a job well done. I considered having my 300 workers just haul up the obelisk with levered ropes, but had to give it up because the thing is just too massive. A small rock temporal lever is here indicated, unless they could temporarily recruit another thousand men for the day. The total time for this obelisk would have been perhaps five years for 300 men, most of that time spent cutting it out of the bedrock. The Apis bull sarcophagus contained the body of an Egyptian cult sacred bull. It may have weighed 60 tons or more. They are installed inside a small room connected to a long hallway. The object piece is pushed with no rollers replaced when going into the small room. When the center of mass is just behind the center roller, the sarcophagus is levered forward till the center of mass goes past the center line of the tipping roller. It will then tip over more gently and not damage the corners. Then the center roller is pulled out by wrapping ropes around both ends of the, in the manner shown. The ropes are pulled and the last roller is pulled to the end of, and at this point a mound of sand is introduced to prevent damage to the front end when the roller is finally pulled out. Then the sand is removed with the last little bit removed with the pillows. Some of these sarcophaguses are lowered into a pit which requires that a wooden track be inlaid in the sand for the rollers. The sarcophagus is then dropped as before and the wood track is dug out from the sides and the rest of the sand is also dug out, thus lowering the box to its final resting place. This looks like a straightforward roller job. However, due to the tremendous weight, the rollers should be a bit more refined than smaller roller jobs. Larger logs, spacers between them to act as a race, to keep them from twisting to varying angles, and a means of turning the box in, in narrow quarters is required. To accomplish turning, there are four grooves in two of the rollers to accommodate copper bananas. As the box is pushed forward, the bananas go up to the box and raise it just enough to pull out all the other rollers. The sarcophagus is then sitting on four points. A specialized short roller is then inserted under the center of the box, along with another banana with a longer high point dwell on it, so that when the box is pushed farther, the other bananas fall out. Now the entire weight is on a single banana under the center of mass. We can now rotate the box and pull out the other rollers. Presumably for safety, they'd put some temporary rocks under to keep it from actually falling over. Once rotated to the desired position, 
the rollers can be put back and the process reversed to lower the sarcophagus onto them. Here's one of the Baalbek stones that never made it. Perhaps this is the limit of what you can do with wood, stone, rope, men, and imagination. Here's the main problem with the Sphinx in my estimation. The head is too small. Look at this blurry aerial view. You can see what I mean. In order to do this type of work, you first have to make a clay model of what you intend to do and present it to the potentate who would cut your head off if you made him look like a fool. Nobody would sign off on a piece of artistic trash like this. In fact, you'd risk at least a major flogging just for presenting such a monstrosity. Clearly, this head has been recarved, as others have suggested. It started out as a lion like this. Other carved sphinxes are more proportionate. And look how the chest is pushed out too much. This would be expected if it was recarved. Now look at the face. It's not weathered enough. Yes, they say it's harder stone up there, but the face is what was out and exposed for the longest time. The body was covered with sand and stayed that way for perhaps millennia, generating zero weathering. The smooth face further supports the idea of recarving. As to who might have initially carved a lion here, I'd guess people living at the time of these people at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. That's nearly 12,000 years ago at the end of the Ice Age. The conjecture here is that something disrupted the advance of civilization long ago and that it restarted as the Egyptian and Sumerian civilizations and others about 5,000 years ago. So the advance of civilization may have been set back by about six or seven thousand years total. Because we have an almost universal flood narrative, perhaps it could have been the cause. The only way that this would be physically feasible is for the end of the Ice Age to form a meltwater ocean over North America or Asia, and for that water to break out into the saltwater ocean suddenly, thereby flooding the coastal regions all over the planet. We need this much water, a mile deep, to raise the oceans 100 feet. The continents are slightly bowed by the action of rising magma that can't get through easily. There's less pressure at the plate boundary with a basalt where all the volcanoes let out the pressure. So the ice accumulates and at over a mile deep is self-sealing. That is, if you melt it and a deep tunnel form to drain into the salt oceans, that tunnel will collapse by the weight of the ice above it. And because the melted ice water is only 90% the volume of ice, there will be a self-sealing wall of ice around the inland ocean about 500 feet high. Eventually the ice wall will become too thin and the water will break out. And that hole will expand extremely fast, draining the entire freshwater ocean in only days. The people on the coast will experience multiple tsunamis that won't quit till a coastal plain shoreline moves back perhaps 100 miles in that short time. They won't be able to run 100 miles in three days, so they all drown or survive by clinging to trees and the like, along with every other type of animal that tries to survive. This is the only possible scenario for an actual basis to the flood narratives. Here's a partial list of things you have to consider when doing large-scale construction with only rope, stone, and wood way back then. All the hypothetical stuff presented here would have been thought of by the ancient Egyptians, and much more that I can't yet imagine. Tens of thousands of men working for a century produces a lot of shop talk and ideas to make the work go easier. There must have been some pride as well knowing that they were working on the biggest thing in the world, something that would survive long after they were gone. So it's not much of a stretch to think that they did all this without help from magic or aliens. 
in the stuff they worked with, they certainly had more experience than anyone nowadays. Our experiences with electricity and more refined aspects of engineering. Our achievements are certainly much greater than theirs, but not relative to our own era. In the end, who do you think really constructed the pyramids? Someone like Leonardo da Vinci? Or Fred Flintstone? If you think it was Fred, I can see why you might be mystified.